So it took me a long time to figure out that it wasn't the wine that I was necessarily passionate about. I like the business, but what it gives me is I'm really passionate about the connection between people, the connection between place and food and everything that wine brings as a connector. It's not necessarily the wine that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about all the things that wine brings along with it. But the fact is we've gotten to a point where people don't even have a, have a nest egg. People don't have a thousand dollars in a in a bank account at all. And that makes people live in this like fire flight state where you can't help your friends. You always have to be looking out for yourself and it destroys community. So coming back to wine, that's a huge part of wine is building community. And within that, I've just found the Bitcoin community as a group of people that has a lot of the same values as I do, as in values, hard work, values, building slowly for the long term and values connection within people. Well, hello, human. Thanks so much for tuning in to the BU Get Paid podcast. I'm your host, Amy Taylor, and I have one goal by being in your ears to explore as many conversations and perspectives as possible on stuff we did not learn in school. You know, stuff that would have actually helped a lot more of us thrive rather than just survive as grown-ups in an often challenging and ever-changing world. As the title might suggest, this includes anything involved with knowing ourselves, understanding money, and generally anything that might offer some insight into how we can all be happier humans. With that in mind, wherever you're listening, you'll find links to some of the best resources I have personally found to help with all of those things. Sometimes I'll talk about these in a bit more detail and I want you to know I will only ever recommend products, services and companies that I am a customer or user of myself. Now, we're all grown-ups here and as such, you'll possibly hear the occasional use of grown-up language. More importantly, anything discussed here is personal opinion and intended for conversational and educational purposes only and should not be taken as financial or investment advice. That's the housekeeping done. Let's get into what I hope is some helpful chat. So thank you for being here. It's very cool to meet you. Um, you were someone who, when I tweeted out about wanting to speak to more Bitcoiners for the podcast, a few people tagged you. I'd seen your wine because other people had tweeted about it. And um, it took like 4.2 seconds to look at your profile and be like, this guy fits the bill for kind of what I'm trying to get across with BU Get Paid, like living your best life being fully you, figuring out what that is. Um, you just told me you're 29. I thought you were a bit younger. Um, and you're just an example, I think, of what is possible in this day and age that doesn't necessarily fit what most people subscribe to in terms of go to college, get a job, figure out you don't like your job, not earn enough money, not understand money. Um, and the last episode I published was... Um, homeschooling and I feel like you're a really good follow-on from that so where I want to start and we'll end up going around in circles probably and coming back to your story because I know not everybody grows up on a farm and tell me how to pronounce the town you're from Paonia Paonia okay that's a tricky one Paonia in Colorado in the mountains mm -hmm. cool so not everybody grows up you, you grew up there right in that area I did yeah not everybody grows up on a, a beautiful sort of massive area of land <laughs> on a winery. Um, but that said, you, you've sort of taken your own path and it's anyway, I don't want to distract myself, but I just was very inspired by what I saw. Cause not many pe young people after college go and do what you're doing, build a house, live on, you know, build a business more than anything. Um, but yeah, you're a great example of someone who just seems to be loving their life. So I'm like, right, this, this Bitcoin I'm definitely going to talk to. But take me back, first of all, you mentioned on a podcast I heard you on, which again is a follow on from homeschooling for me. You said your parents cut you off when you went to college <laughs> financially. Is that right? Oh, I think right after college. So my... Okay. The deal was that they were going to support me through college to, okay. and like all growing up, like my job during school time was school. And so in college, yep. it's worry about school. But yeah, I remember at day after graduation, filled up the gas, the tank one last time. My dad said, all right, give me the credit card. Uh, Did you know that was coming? <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Yep. Um, and honestly, like I'd kind of been excited for it because I had been realizing that like I wanted to focus on my personal finances and that's just something that I was weirdly 
really into. And so mm-hmm. I couldn't really do that if I was living off of um, my parents. And so yeah. basically as soon as I got off that, I just dove into building a crazy Excel spreadsheet that I still operate to track awesome. everything. So how old were you at that point when you finished 22. college? Because it's you're 22 when you finished college. So you're 22. Mm-hmm. What did you study at college? Was it relevant to what you're doing now? A little bit. I was a geologist. It was okay. really just, yeah. My school was, you take a class for three and a half weeks, and then you get mm-hmm. four days off, and then you take another class. So you're really focused all on one thing. And with geology, you go camping for like two of those weeks. So I took one class Goodness. and was like, wait, I can do this for school. I'm going to I'm gonna be a yeah. geologist. And so when you say school, are you talking about high school or college? College, yeah. Sorry, Which, probably what, a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah, there's just I start, different countries. Okay, it's probably university for you. Um, yep. There's different designations. They're the same thing, but like you're bigger if you're a university, but you, I went to a college, but it's the same mm. thing. So like 18? 18 to 22. Got it. Okay, yeah, that's the same. Mm. Same as university. Yeah. So, Mm. and prior to that, were you homeschooled or did you, was it kind of... I went to public school. Public school. Okay, cool. So outside of what you're doing now, pretty traditional upbringing. Um, You Mm. get to 18, you go to college or what we, some of us would know as university. You study geology um, and then you get to 22, you're filling up the petrol. Your dad says, give me that credit card. You're on your own. So where were you living? What did you do? Well, I... Got a job as a for a water resources consulting company, just okay. as an intern in in Denver, which is the big city so in cool. Colorado. Yep. And just moved up there. A bunch of people I went to college with, girlfriend at the time, were living there, so it was just you know pretty easy yeah. right out of college. And then I moved to well, that was just for the summer, and then I moved to. A ski town in Colorado and worked in a ski shop and skied all the time that winter and then I moved to <laughs> Vietnam for a year and taught English wow oh so you did you've got your travel things out of your system as well that's good good to hear <laughs> I'm getting that's it back cool. again I mean starting the winery is kind of having me uh a little cash strap and, and locational mm. location centralized for the last five years but yeah that yeah. I got my for sure that was a life goal was just ski bum than travel so got that out of the system I can understand that yeah um it's interesting actually side note I was listening to you talking about how I think Pinot Noir is your focus wine or your sort of Mm -hmm. the the one that grows best where you are I lived in Queenstown New Zealand for a while as a result of initially going there to do a ski season and central Otago probably one of the leading other regions for Pinot Noir so that's that's the extent of my wine knowledge to be honest um (laughs) So when I was listening to you, what I loved was when you, you said, and I'm jumping around the things that I wanted to ask you, but it's just kind of segueing in. Mm-hmm. You said someone in Texas asked you, how do we get Pinot Noir to grow here? It just won't, won't grow here. And this is where what you do and my lens th- for what I'm trying to achieve to bring Bitcoin to more people is your answer was just make Texas wine. Stop messing mm-hmm. with nature and let it express itself. So talk to me a bit about what made you want to start a winery? Because those kind of value systems underneath what you do is just perfect for me. I just think it's such a great way to live. And it, it's obviously why you then understood Bitcoin or feel the way you do about Bitcoin. It's certainly why I do. So yeah, tell me what made you want to start a winery um, and how that went. I always knew that I would have my own business or figure out something I didn't really ever plan on working for people knew that that was going to be the case getting started and everything but I I always I grew up with my dad always did his own thing my mom was a stay-at-home mom once I was born and so I kind of just always had the idea that I'd find something to do on my own and I tried a couple like little small businesses basically when I lived in Vietnam I realized for sure that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, a businessman, whatever it was, and started a couple small businesses when I moved back. And then those didn't really go anywhere. I was hating my job as a geologist, realized there was no real career path there as far as having my own business and actually doing geology. And just was on the phone with my dad one day, 
like normal conversation and he had been making wine as a hobby his for ever since we moved to Peonia. And wow. so he made really good wine and I knew that he didn't really know what he was doing at all. So I kind of just said, that's a good idea. I'll go for it. Because mm -hmm. if you figured it out, I'm sure I can. And uh, a couple attitude. months later, I was doing the paperwork to start a winery. So wow. really, it it was always something that like, I think it was like my fallback option to move back home and, and do something. I always didn't think I would move back home until I was like 40 with a wife and a kid. But here I was 25 and single moving back to a 2000 person town to start a business on the farm. Wow. So when you said when you'd move back home, you mean to your hometown, which of 2000 people, yeah. I can't even imagine what, how remote that must be. Um, <laughs> like I can't imagine I've been to remote places, but so your dad or your family obviously had land. They had yeah, so we have for you to do. My dad's that. life dream was to live on a farm and grow all his own food. And so he, like I said, built houses his whole life and at 54 sold everything that he'd amassed and bought a, bought this farm, basically. And so I grew up on the farm working the fields and honestly wasn't a huge fan of farming, uh, probably because I was forced into it and it was, you know, you hate, you rebel as the yeah. son of a farmer. But I knew, also knew it was a pretty special place to be. I mean, we're right on the river, surrounded by other orchards. It's an awesome town. It's just small. Mm -hmm. And there's so much good food and good people that move here to create their own thing mm -hmm. and just kind of live and not be bothered by anything else. So it's a great spot. Like I said, I always thought I'd move back here. I just didn't think I'd do yeah. it until I was older. Yeah. That's very cool. It sounds so wholesome. And I think it's one of those things now that, that people are, I have mixed feelings on it because my partner and I have talked about, oh, it would be so nice to have more space, but unless it's something where you can, it, it's either a labor of love because it's a lot of work having, mm -hmm. having land as a farmer, whether it's a working farm or just a lifestyle, it, you've got to want to do that work. I think a lot of people now are starting to think, oh, I want to grow my own veggies and have all this space. But if you've got a full-time job, you've then got to come home and spend your weekends doing that. So I think people possibly have a bit of a fairy tale fantasy of what that looks like, but it's something you knew. Um, but I love the fact that I actually thought your dad started a wine business and you kind of just took it and grow it and grew it. Um, so it's cool to hear that it was actually your idea and you kind of saw that he had, well, it's just everything I loved. Like he had, he had a, a passion and a, a skill, I guess. And you've kind of brought the business mind to it to turn it into something much bigger, which is very, very cool. And you're getting to do it with your dad. So you move back <laughs> and you tell me about building the house. Because I saw that tweet well, and was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. <laughs> uh, just to step back real quick, I've, I've sure. seen a lot of people move here that want to own a farm and it's their life dream and everything. Mm. It's just like it was my dad. So like I've lived, both lived in and seen it secondhand and most people don't last my dad's 75 and still works eight hours a day on the tractor and and doing wow. physical labor but that's what he loves to do so it's it's not a huge deal for him i like i said grew up knowing that it wasn't necessarily for me so mm -hmm. i like the wine and the the business side and the farming stuff i still leave up to him honestly but since my dad built houses his whole life. I've also spent a lot of, not a ton of time, but I've also built things growing up. I mean, that was my summer job was always on the farm and sometimes there were sheds to build and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I had started the winery in 2019, made my first batch of wine, was still working full time as a geologist and living in Denver. For, so five hours away from Peonia and commuting home once a month to make the wine. The thing with wine is it takes at least a year, maybe two years, depending on how long you want to age it. So mm -hmm. I started the winery in 2019, invested my entire life savings, and then didn't have anything to sell for two years. You know, I didn't know what I was doing, so I didn't know if my wine was good. And I had to figure out stuff to do, finance my life, so work another job, and continue investing a second value worth of my life savings the next year. Yeah. So... I 
really was hating my job as a geologist and was kind of looking for the next thing to do, knowing I had all this wine in the cellar and the wine was my next big step. So I have to stay nearby because I have to touch the wine once a month at least. And then I don't really want to work just some random crappy job and just live. So we had this space on our property that was just kind of begging for a house to be built that wording coming from someone who builds houses his whole life. So my dad just had a vision for this space and it was the logical thing for me to do was move home and build a house and presumably inherit it one day. So I kind of just went for it. So honestly, just like the, the winery was the low hanging fruit, logical next step. So was the building that house yeah. and mm. just, it was really just taking what was the what was it laid out in front of me and and working hard mm -hmm. for it and now I've got a lot to show for it all these years later. Oh my god, that was so well articulated as well because you know there was part of me thinking you know will people relate to this because not everybody has a family that's got a massive amount of land in a remote place where they can just build a house. I think that trend will probably start to flourish as we move to a Bitcoin standard, or at least I believe it will. Um, anyone who doesn't understand that, please listen to Ben and go learn about Bitcoin and it will start to make sense. Um, because, you know, people do flock to cities, like you said, even you went off to Denver. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just love so much of what you said, because through my lens of both entrepreneurship or solopreneurship and starting your own thing, you know, you knew it was going to take a crap ton of investment and risk, um, you all kind of winging it. You'll figure it out as you go. That's a, a huge lesson for anyone who wants to fly the plane whilst they're building it and take that leap of faith. But also just accepting that you're not going to make money straight away. There's a, you know, there's a lot of parallels from your story, regardless of someone's circumstances, that I think are just so important, um, especially on the financial front. Um, and I, I'm glad you've already told me all of that about your dad and his background, because I think I've got friends certainly that have got family businesses and it seems like the natural thing to step into the family business and then I guess because it's in front of them and it's an easy option but they don't actually love it so I love that you mm. kind of had the awareness to go well there's all these elements here but I don't want to be a farmer <laughs> but um you see honestly what I it took me a while to even I was never a, like a big wine guy either so it wasn't for the love of wine that I started this. It was really just, I want to have a business and I want to commit. I really want to commit to something right now that I can move forward with my life and really strive towards something. And so it took me a while to figure out, look, if I'm going to be a winemaker, if I'm going to do this, I have to be somewhat passionate about it or else I'm just not going to do it very well. So yeah. it took me a long time to figure out that it wasn't the wine that I was necessarily passionate about. I like the business, but what it gives me is, I'm really passionate about the connection between people, the co connection between place and food and everything that wine mm -hmm. brings as a connector. It's not necessarily the wine that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about all the things that wine brings along with it. It's an incredible business to have. It's like so low time preference and I can mm -hmm. learn alongside as my wine grows. Um, and I get invited to a lot of good dinners and can just be part of dinners for a lot of people. I mean, whether I'm there or not, it's cool to share my wine with them. So I don't think like day to day, it's necessarily realistic to say, I'm going to find something I'm passionate about all the time. I agree. And I hope yeah. it is. I like, I hope it is for most people follow what you want to do. But mm -hmm. if you can find that angle that you're passionate about and do the rest, but really strive, let's build on that angle. Like mm -hmm. I want to build a community space beyond a tasting room that my whole community gathers. It hopefully revitalize the main street of my town because it's a small town. One business can have a huge influence. And with that, like I said, it's a small town. There's some negatives to living here, but if I can be a bit of that change and build some more community, then I can build also build a town that I want to live in. Oh, amen. It's people right? Mm -hmm. Everything comes down to people. And yeah, so much. That's awesome. I hadn't heard you say that on any of the podcasts I found you on or, or any of your tweets. But oh, wow, so much to unpack from that. We should just end there. No, it's too short. Um, 
Well, it's true. Like, I think a lot of people do. I try not to use the language of just follow your passion, but I do think you can bring your passions into whatever you're doing to make you more of a unique character and a unique personal brand, which is what I'm about. But everything you've just said there is so on point for anyone who wants to start their own thing. It's just, you know, don't wait. You are going to wing it. But on top of that, you're not going to feel passionate about jumping out of bed about anything every single day. <clears throat> and like you say, if you can find your angle and have a vision, and I think your dad had a vision as well. I'm sure he's loving having family on the property as a farmer. It's something that I've, I've got a mate who's a farmer and it's, it's a real family. It's, it's so wholesome. Um, I couldn't do it, but it's, it's lovely. Um, but there's, there's so much gold in that advice, I think, because it is hard. It will be a low time preference. And that's probably a, a perfect segue for anyone who doesn't, who's not a Bitcoiner or hasn't heard that term. It's being patient, right? Essentially, it's putting in the work to know that the rewards will come later and not and sacrificing in the short term. But you seem to certainly be a very happy guy who's enjoying that process in the now as well, which is brilliant because I think a lot of people just hustle and grind and try and make something work that they can't find the enjoyment in. But that mindset is is great. Um, so that's probably a good point to segue into Bitcoin because you've mentioned low, prefer low time preference. And I know that you did you start off in farmers markets and just in person in the community? And that's another point. You know, a lot of what I do is online and people are trying to find the hack to to be mobile. But at the end of the day, business branding, everything, it comes down to people. Um, so tell me how you got started with like the farmers markets. And actually, no, let's go back. Tell me how you found Bitcoin, because I think that came next. <laughs> yeah, I found Bitcoin before I started selling any wine. Oh, awesome. I, okay. Yeah, so definitely the right segue chronologically. Um, yep. I had been living with a Bitcoiner that I randomly moved in with off of Craigslist in Denver. We were <laughs> friends, but he was kind of my li crazy libertarian friend, and I was probably his... his uh, Buddy that voted for left-wing politicians and <laughs> interesting so Who i didn't friends, I, I was just like just saying like i was on a totally different wavelength um thinking about it back then and i never really gave it any thought i remember where when he ran upstairs and like was like oh i just bought some bitcoin in the 2020 crash down to 3000 when everything was going oh. crazy but really i didn't think much of it and then Right after that, when I moved back home to Paonia, I moved in with another really good friend who was also a Bitcoiner. Okay. And so this guy I'd grown up with, and he was, I considered him one of the smartest people I know. And so we just talked politics, finance, mm -hmm. global power shifts, all that stuff. And nice. <laughs> he kind of just convinced me to start learning about it. And as I was building the house, I just put on six hours of Bitcoin podcasts every day. And it was not because I was like forcing it. It was because mm -hmm. it was that interesting to me because I'd been really interested in personal finance. I'd been help, like going over to my friend's houses for lunch to be like, hey, we're, today we're going to spend an hour working on your personal finances because I was a nerd about it. And I'd already done mine and I wanted to mess with more of it. I wanted to get people the right credit card, the right savings account, all that stuff. So yeah. it was definitely something that I just kind of dove into and it fit. I mean, growing up in this farm, like a, a, a on a farm I, where my dad works for everything that he had, the low time preference mindset of buying something that is insanely undervalued and holding on to it was easy. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that also with the wine is the same idea. It just kind of came naturally to me. I've never been much of a gambler when it comes to money. Mm -hmm. um, so just I, the mindset of saving my money in something that can't be debased was was super natural. Yeah. And in your investigation, you mentioned that you'd kind of naturally had an interest in personal finance and, and self-teaching, I guess, or self-educating in personal finance. Had you ever stopped? Because I think this is definitely, it's definitely my journey. And I think for a lot of people... You, prior to going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, learning about personal finance never involves the question of what is money or what, how does money work? Why do we have money? 
especially from someone on a farm who perhaps bartering is still something you might do from time to time. I don't know. In small communities, you sometimes find that people still do that. So did you... I traded when you would go, Yeah, I bet. Um, love it. Um, but when you were prior to finding Bitcoin and you were learning, self-educating on personal finance, did you ask the question, what is money? Or was it Bitcoin that made you do that? I listened to a couple podcasts about it, but it was never a focus. Yeah. So I had had some context in the history of money, which was super helpful in, in learning about Bitcoin. But the biggest, one of the bigger things was I was always looking for no, I didn't want to take on risk right. outside of okay. what you like need to do, quote unquote. And so I was all, never stock picking or read a book about investing. I was like, well, I'm never going to be able to put in that much time. So mm -hmm. just index funds, high interest savings accounts, and kind of just auto automate everything and budget and save money and you're good. And so then learning about Bitcoin, mm. well, first of all, my high interest savings accounts lost all their interest rates. So they went down to zero in 2019. And so I was like, okay, so this is kind of rigged. I can't keep up with inflation just by saving money. Yeah. So then started learning about Bitcoin because the floor got ripped out from under me and realized that all the, I mean, all the money was just a scam at this point. So opt out and with Bitcoin, I can just save money and keep it simple. And it's, I mean, it's not stock picking. It's learning about money. Yeah. And um, you said something just there. I was going to, inflation. So what was your understanding of, of what inflation was in simple terms prior to Bitcoin? This was like the ultimate boogeyman for me and the hardest thing for me to, the last wall to break before I finally totally understood Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I just took CPI number for what it was. And then as I started learning more and more about Bitcoin, obviously you learn that that's just totally manipulated. Nonsense. <laughs> and you also learn so much about how, I mean, price inflation is so psychological. If we all think that prices will go up, they will go up. And I was listening to these NPR, National Public Radio, very left-leaning modern monetary policy, modern monetary theory, thinking people that were just gaslighting me into thinking like, it's in my, inflation's in my head and... If we just don't believe it, it'll go away. And then with mm. Bitcoin comes, I learned that they changed the def they changed the definition in the 1980s from monetary debasement to price inflation. Mm. And once I got that, and once I got the natural state of the world is technology improving, thus giving us deflation from Jeff Booth's Price of Tomorrow book, that was the final cliff for me. Yeah. So in because it's interesting, like a lot of guys that I know um, I'm 40 you're obviously 10 years younger but I think this sort of 25 to maybe 50 age group that I seem to sit in which I know is a big broad range but it, it's usually I find men who are especially in relationships heterosexual relationships <laughs> I have to be so PC these days are very interested um, I guess it's a maybe a primeval thing of providing I do but they are interested in finance but not necessarily again because they're passionate about it because they feel they need to be to keep up with inflation and a, a particular friend of ours who's super savvy with it but he spends a lot of time studying it I can't remember exactly what he said but and he gets it but he doesn't get bitcoin he's very risk averse he's very traditional with with doing stocks and shares but he he said to me well inflation we need inflation because we need the prices, to, we need the economy stimulated. And I was like, this guy is so close to getting it because that's what I thought. I didn't really understand what the term inflation meant other than prices go up and they always will, which is why people buy houses, not because they need to live in them, but because it's something that will always go up. And so for me, it was understanding eventually after a lot of brain fog and I don't really get it. And then it just clicked. It's like, well, if they increase the amount of money, it's like anything with supply and demand. If there's more of it, it's less valuable. It's that simple. Um, plus finding out that CPI and these figures that you see that aren't interesting to most people is just completely made up. Like inflation's, it's, things aren't going up. 
because CPI is this. It's like, well, my fuel for my car that I drive to work has gone up by 30%, or in your case, as a, as a farmer or someone with a business, everything I need to produce my product has gone up, which means my profit is less. Um, so how did that click for you? I know if you say inflation was the final piece, but how did that sort of flip in your head to what it actually is? I, I had a lot of the same issues as, as your friend. I mean, mm. we're, if I, if you really like listen and learn about modern monetary theory, those people will all say that deflation is bad. What they mean is disinflation is bad. And that's the amount of money. I don't, honestly, I can't even totally explain that. that like you get into the fiat yeah. system and you're just constantly bombarded by these new tool, these new words that you have to figure out and then figure out all these, these background things. It's just this like quagmire of misunderstanding mm -hmm. that is, in my opinion now is built to dissuade us from learning about it. And so right. one of my, <laughs> one of my, the biggest issue was, yeah, we need a world we, where prices inflate. Otherwise people aren't going to buy things. And mm -hmm. that had me for a little while and because I didn't have another framework. And so mm -hmm. learning about or thinking about the world with fixed monetary units and thinking about how prices would be, is understanding that prices would go down because we get better at producing things. Obviously, some go down more than others, and there are some things that are scarce that mm -hmm. could cause prices to go up in the long term. Mm -hmm. But it's not like if the gas price doesn't go up at the fuel station, I'm not going to buy it. I'm going to continue buying gas, and I'll probably buy more if it goes down. But the world does not stop if prices don't go up because I consume things. I always need to be buying things to live. And if I can just save money and have my savings increase in value where I get more comfortable, I'll constantly be a new buyer of new things because I'll want to increase my quality of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you can increase, if you can just save your money because you know that money is going to continue to buy the same things at the same price, then there's an mm -hmm. incentive to save. And keep it as yours exactly. in your bank account. Yeah. Even so that's even... where Go on. that's where the that's where he probably gets stuck because he's like, Well, why would I spend money if my money gets more value? I'm gonna be more incentivized to save. And the truth is you will, one hundred percent. Especially if there's like a transitionary moment, the first little bit, so many more people are gonna be incentivized to save until they build up that nest egg. And then you build up a nest egg. You're safe. You can spend some money. You can go travel. You can do nice things. Mm. But the fact is, we've gotten to a point where people don't even have a have a nest egg. People don't have a thousand dollars in a in a bank account at all. Yeah. And that makes people live in this like flight or flight state where oh, yeah. fight or flight state where you can't help your friends. You always have to be looking out for yourself, and it destroys community. So coming back to wine, that's a huge part of wine is building community. And within that, I've just found the Bitcoin community as a group of people that has a lot of the same values as I do, as in values, hard work, values, building slowly for the long term and values connection within people. And so the winery has kind of been just my conduit for being able to be out there as a Bitcoiner. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, a lot of people with that find Bitcoin want to go work within the Bitcoin industry, but there's only so many jobs. It's growing. You might not really enjoy it. So I just find that it's pretty awesome to just go do what you do as a Bitcoiner. I mean, mm -hmm. all I do is I just put a sign that says I accept Bitcoin and mm -hmm. people then maybe associate Bitcoin with a cool winery instead of crime and climate stuff that the New York Times tries to push on them. So it's really just been a kind of a natural connection between what I really am passionate about and what I'm doing all the time. I love it. There was so many points there where I was going to like, oh, let me jump in on that. But I've learned to just let people speak because you're on such a good flow. Um, so go just rewinding. I'm, I haven't made notes because I'm trying to stay more present in these conversations because it's so great. Um, what you said, let me rewind, let me think. You said about 
money when you're talking about inflation and how they how it's so complex to understand and you think possibly it's been designed that way i do think there's an element of that if we go dark and conspiracy theory but even if we don't and we just say it is complicated there are way too many layers to it and i think with what you do with wine and the parallels and the the simplicity of nature is such a great lens to look through Bitcoin as money as and Jack and Jack Mallers and Dorsey in their recent interview in Jack Mallers new podcast, which was very long, but it was so it was the best conversation and how Jack Dorsey, you know, is a barefoot hippie living in Bali. Love the guy founder of Twitter for anyone who doesn't know. I think what you're getting at is very similar. It's wine is a simple process not easy but very simple leave it alone all the wine you make is natural preservative free which i've been buying preservative free wine for a long time because you're right it does no headaches the next morning i've heard you say that for anyone who's listening um a lot of my friends should be pulled into this episode just because it's got wine in it um <coughs> you know you say about leaving it alone and keeping it simple and as close to nature as possible which is why you told the texan guys make the wine that works in texas and keep it simple work with nature and jack Dorsey was saying a similar thing about money it's just become so removed from a natural thing that allows people to interact you're right it's now causing us all to be so divided and I don't think people have joined the dots between money being the issue we're divided about all this other stuff but people are communities are falling apart and society breaks when people just don't work together um, and we we reduce ourselves to this animalistic angry behavior because our basic needs are threatened and you kind of touched on that then with people don't even have enough money they can't draw on enough savings to cover a health emergency right um and community that's what we're here for we're human like animals don't necessarily build communities the way we can and trade and they work probably better together than we do at the moment <laughs> um so tell me when you started and and you're right about the Bitcoin community as well. A lot of people are looking for um, jobs in Bitcoin because they get so passionate about it. But there's just I'm trying to do what you're doing, which is just introduce it to what you do anyway. And a lot of what I do is just coaching around getting people to know themselves better. Not necessarily everyone has to start a business, but just figure out what works for you. And, and Bitcoin as money just fits into that when people get that the freedom piece, the personal expression piece. Um, so you start going to farmers markets, you say you accept Bitcoin, what kind of reaction does it get? I mostly just kind of got the nudge as like two girls were walking by and be like, oh my God, Bitcoin, we should tell your brother about that. Okay. And it wasn't <laughs> like younger too people? serious. Yeah, like, yeah, like uh, okay. 20 year olds. And then okay. I would also, the most common thing would be a bunch of like, baby boomers coming up and be like, Hey, you better be careful there, boy. You know, it's down 50%. I'd be like, dude, it's down 70% and I'm buying more. Like you obviously don't understand this. I don't need your, your patronizing right now. Um, and so that was all well and good. And that was for them for a while. That was all I got. But then I started getting Bitcoiners coming up randomly. Um, one of my favorites is this woman came up to me tried my wine, liked it, but then saw the Bitcoin sign. I was like, oh my God, Bitcoin, you have to talk to my husband. And wow. all I got that was like, okay, your husband has gone insane just like I have because you figure out Bitcoin and you kind of go crazy. <laughs> or this is the most important thing in the world. I have to tell everyone for like a couple of years. And he doesn't have many Bitcoiners to talk to it, I mean, to talk about it with. Cause I mean, I, I know mm. I, lived with Bitcoiners and still didn't feel like I had enough. So she's heard enough. And so she brings her husband over and we talk for a little bit. Um, and then we grabbed, we grabbed a beer like the next week. And then a couple of weeks later, he was or like a while later, he was in town. And then I saw him this summer as well. So we just maintained a friendship there, but more and more Bitcoiners come up and That's so cool. people are curious and there's a lot of just the nudging as well just look bitcoin but there's also people that ask questions mm. people that are into it that the coolest thing is the people that have never made a bitcoin transaction before but are super into it so oh, yeah. i had to yeah i never used the lightning network before i started doing this i had no reason to and so i had to teach myself that teach mm -hmm. myself how to 
teach people how to use the Lightning Network. And yep. that's been pretty cool being people's first Bitcoin purchase, purchase with Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, it makes it real because that's what people, that's the first, uh, well, not the first thing, but a common thing is, I was talking to someone yesterday, older lady, you know, can I buy my food with it? Yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> Providing whoever you're, you're talking to or buying from accepts it in the same way that as long as the person you're buying from wants dollars or whatever your fiat currency is, that's all that matters. Um, that's So that's very cool. And the other thing um, from a monetary perspective is you tweeted recently, people ask why you have and this is more of a brand p building your personal brand again whether it's intentional or not you've done a really good job of that you said people were you took a picture and said people ask why there's a big truck on your label with peony wine at uh, peony lane i don't think i've even mentioned the name of the winery yet but peony lane peony lane yeah i make natural wine in colorado there's a, a lane. picture of a truck on a, on the label right. my joke is that i say i stared at it every day and i think you should too but <laughs> really, there was basically this truck that ran for 60 years, just cool truck, dump truck died outside my childhood bedroom window. And we just left it there and have now planted a vineyard behind it. Mm -hmm. And that truck was on my dad's original wine label. And so I kind of took oh, okay. a lot of the elements of what my dad did. He sold wine for like two years. Otherwise, it was a hobby. I took elements of his yep. label, his brand and made it my own. So like made it a lot more clean, kept the winery, kept the kind of font and style and everything. Cause I want to give an ode to him. I mean, I wouldn't be here doing this if it wasn't for him achieving his dreams and also helping me along with this and getting me going. So little odes to him like that are, are fun. Um, but on the, the Bitcoin commerce thing is it's, it's super important to support your community. I believe you want to have people that are producing things that you want close to where you are in case there's ever a big issue. Like we saw mm -hmm. supply chains get super wrecked in 2020. If there's ever an issue with major supply chains, you want to already have dialed who you're going to contact and you want them to actually still be in business so that you can get whatever you need to get locally. And then layering Bitcoin on top of that is just money that can't be debased. So it, it helps out your local farmer more if you can help them build a Bitcoin stack or educate them on 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 money and, and Bitcoin's the, the ultimate element of that. So I see spending Bitcoin and using it as like a super anti-fragile practice, getting good at using it and actually knowing how to do things in case something goes wrong and you need it in a pinch it's good to know what you're doing and two if you can get people educated on it they're more likely to be there in the long term as a successful business providing the things you need because bitcoin is that life raft for people oh my goodness so well put um yeah <laughs> there's and I think that's again we started just before or I, I we're talking about the truck which took you into that um when it comes to making money, building a brand, that, that 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 part of our conversation just started with storytelling. Like I'm asking you about the truck and you've again taken it back so brilliantly to real life, real people, real communities. And it's like a lot of people when you sort of, I mean, I don't watch mainstream news, but I think people just overlook that part. I've certainly had a lot of clients and and students that I've worked with when it comes to learning marketing, who, who just want to make money, they just want to make money online. And it's like, at the end of the day, you're just, it's an online version of ma yeah, making money online is, is just more commerce. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to people. You've got to connect with people through your stories, through your brand, whatever you're building. And you just seem to have done that really effortlessly um, because you're doing it the right way. It's about the people. It's about what we all need, goods and services and products that solve problems or, or meet a desire. Um, so thank you for sharing yourself and your story through the likes of Twitter and social media, because it's worked. I mean, you've, you've got a following, I think of just over 11,000. Has that come, do you think from being in the Bitcoin space more? Have you got a sense of where that following has grown from? Or do you think that's more your business that's grown that or both? I would say it's primarily Bitcoiners, people that are also looking to homestead, 
as well. And those people are generally Bitcoin curious, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't get on okay. Twitter to like grow a personal brand and build a following or sell wine or anything. It no, all kind of just happened by just being there and being didn't, myself. I know you have done so. it really well. <laughs> Thank you. That, there's the lesson. That's exactly what I was hoping you'd say is the people that don't try and do it, do it best. Um, and the people that try and do it generally forget the core principles of what you've just said, which is about people. It's about product services, solving problems, helping people, building communities. And, and you're doing it in the real world, which gives you these amazing stories to share, which is what makes people love you, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. You've, you've wrapped that up really well. Um, I think we've covered everything I certainly wanted to cover. I think what I normally, what I'll ask you, which I normally like to finish with is just advice to your younger self. I mean, I think you're living a great life and you've done everything right, but what would you say about, I guess, being you making your own choices, knowing who you are? And also, what would you what would you advise your younger self about knowing money and understanding money, what to do about money, if you say rewound to 18 year old Ben, who's about to go off to college to study geology? What advice would you give him about those two things? Well, about money, I kind of was always pretty frugal, like having my parents credit card was never a carte blanche spend on stuff. It was always, I was raised in a frugal family. So I'm yeah, feel like I did pretty good with that. I mean, you find Bitcoin when you're going to find Bitcoin really what, where my head went is mm. I always would tell myself, I remember specifically one time I was like a little kid and had super horrible posture sitting at a table. Um, and my sister told me to fix my posture and I always kind of said, in my head, I was always like, oh, I'll do that when I'm older. And so I think procrastination was always the thing that that killed me with with um, health and diet. And I mean, I always played sports, but like never really wanted to work out or anything. Um, I don't know. It's just mm -hmm. I would I think do it now, get it over with and discipline is is kind of the things I would hound on which are totally the things my dad would tell me and that's why I didn't want to do them but now that I've figured out Bitcoin I think I've got this lower time preference because I know I've got something to live I know I'm going to have a good life in the future so I want to be able to enjoy it and so I'm pretty focused on the present building the long-term health structures and obviously business structures to be able to enjoy those things in the future. Wow, awesome advice. And I think as well, from, certainly from listening to you, and it, it, it's done the same for me, until I found Bitcoin, I had been vegetarian for a good few years. And as a child, I self-elected to be vegetarian because I couldn't stand the thought of, of lovely animals and yada, yada, yada. But um, <laughs> it was, I know you're into steak. Um, are you trading your wine for steak? Is that one of the things that you, you do in your community? Definitely. I. I went bigger and I bought yeah. half a cow because there's a, a rancher around here that's a Bitcoiner that I wanted to support and it's just easier to buy in mm -hmm. bulk. But at these farmers markets, mm -hmm. I trade for all kinds of things. And like I come these days, yeah. I, mushrooms, ceramics, a custom cutting board, um, all kinds of veggies, meat, cheese, like ham, beef, chicken, like everything I can get for wine if i if i really was like diligent yeah. and it's hard because i'm on the road a lot doing these farmers markets but if i was really diligent i could just not spend money on food and just pay for everything in wine all summer because where i live there's so much good food That's and cool. going to these farmers markets you're just in the nexus of of yeah. that and people want to share what they make and i share what i make so mm. I think if you're if you're generous with producers and you just become friends with them, they want to share what they do with you, and that a lot of times in, results in really good food. Oh, there's and there's more lessons in that, right? Like the proof of work conversation we haven't even touched on. Um, you know, when you're there in real life in in a community of real people with real products, that that is the proof of their work. <laughs> you all want mm -hmm. each other's stuff, um, and I, yeah, there's just. It's a great blueprint, I think, for how to live wherever you might be. I mean, we, we now have technology that's, that allows us to produce good food in much smaller spaces. Um, so it's not like 
everyone needs to live on a farm in the remote mountains of Colorado, like we said before. I don't um, recommend it for most and people. And it's just interesting, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> no, me neither. I can imagine. But I think what what I was getting onto there with telling you I used to be vegetarian is just this lens of money. It affects it affects everyone, and it touches every area of your life. And I just think the fact that you shared the lesson being what you would tell your younger self is to focus on your health. It's it's when you start to see that supply chains and food and literally everything has been destroyed or significantly lowered in quality in terms of what's best for human beings because of profitability, right? And broken money. Um, and you mentioned as well with nature, it's just food should be simple. We don't need to mess with it. Interesting that you raised the point that the lesson to your younger self was, was about health. Um, and it's it's the Bitcoin lens for me. The reason I told you I went vegetarian was because it was going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and realizing how much it's impacted food production and what we're being told to eat by mainstream media. And, you know, I've jumped from being vegetarian to eating meat again and very simple, simple food like meat and vegetables and farmers market purchased fruit and vegetables, you know, and it just it's it's mind blowing when I think back to the kind of stuff I was eating. It wasn't, I didn't think it was bad, but health and what we what we eat can be very simple. Um, and you seem to have definitely gone down that path too. Obviously you're a farmer, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but when I was a kid, best. <laughs> my, my parents' deal was to like eat all the food they grow. And um, it was really always like grow. as high quality ingredients as you could get. But I, mm. I'm someone who likes to rebel. And so I rebelled and my form of rebellion was like eating crappy food or just not eating. And so I realized in, yeah. in college, I think it hit me. I developed somewhat of an eating disorder where I would hit a point in my meal where if I, I knew if I took one, one more bite, I would have to go puke. And so I, my nutrition was really lacking. I mm. didn't really know what to do. All I kind of figured out was if I had, it's, I mean, it was all in my head. All I had to the only thing I figured out how to do is if I can just have one, like a portion, like my meal is a burger instead of going to the all you can eat place and getting a bunch of different things. It's like, if you can just focus on this one thing, you can finish it and you're going to be fine. And that helped for a bit, but mm -hmm. I was always having super clouded mind or just like out of it while still achieving a lot. I mean, I've, I've always been extremely athletic and um, doing well and, school and and work and everything but it was always with this kind of hollow feeling in my body and so in 2022 i my goal or my focus for the year which is vague but it's something i really wanted to improve on was my health because i knew that if i wanted to take my business to the next level i needed to take my body and my mind to the next level to really be able to support myself because i felt so hollow i felt like oh everything I've achieved now is great. But if I keep like, I would just be so much further if my body and, and mind were working the way I would like them to work. And so there was a, a beef initiative, which is like, um, local ranchers support your support your local food system, um, slash Bitcoin slash a lot of other things conference right nearby me. And I gave a tour of my winery for that, went to it, met a lot of great people. And there's these two guys called the, that have a podcast called the Meat Mafia. And they cured some yes. diseases of theirs by just eating beef. And so they came to my house to try wine and I got to meet them and was just like, you guys are the most vital, like you have the most vitality of any person I've ever talked to. What are you doing? And obviously they're just eating a ton of beef. So I started eating a ton of beef. My brain fog went away and I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to diet, but like I've cut out pretty much carbs or I've cut out bread, I guess, processed foods and focus on just whole foods. Much to my mom's delight, she brings me raw milk every week just because she's so psyched I'm finally eating healthy. So that helps. But it's been such an wow. unlock that I really wish I'd figured out health earlier. Yeah, right. 
And that's the perfect explanation as to what you were saying about discipline. But it, again, I just, as you're talking, I just keep thinking about the parallels with that, that Jack and Jack conversation about money should also be simple. Basically anything in our lives as humans that we've um, added so much complexity to, i.e. removing as far away from nature as possible, or, or the more layers we add between us and nature, the less it works. And, and fiat foods is an example, and fiat money is the same. And the two are absolutely linked because it's like our food has been debased, right? The quality and the hardness of, of how, how good it is for us just isn't there, and money's the same. And they're 100% they're a product of one another. So I love what you're saying about food. It's great. A hundred percent. And it's all like this. It's funny. It's all this like grandpa advice that you, you would get from a gen two generations above you with all that life experience. But all these Bitcoiners are figuring it out yes. and living their best lives or figuring out how to be on that path. And I think a lot of it has to do with you're not worried about money so much anymore. You're not worried about making it in the future. You figured out Bitcoin, you figured out money, you kind of realize how early it is and you're probably going to see a lot of gains, but also you just have something, you have a bright hope for the future because you see that money was such a big problem for the world. And if we can just fix money, so many of the problems that we have that people are just like frozen in fear by will be fixed. So it's this hopeful sense mm -hmm. that lends to wanting to invest in your present to build for the long term instead of just being living for the dopamine hits and not worrying about things and partying all the time. So it's funny seeing all these young Bitcoiners become grandpas yeah. before our eyes, because I, I mean, I have definitely. And um, I don't know, it's going to be a fun future. So it's I want to be ready for it. Oh, I think you're more than ready for it, mate. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it, I say that a lot. The money thing, it's people are in a state of fear and paralysis with jobs and not changing things because this fear of the future or this constant awareness of you have to be. In, and it's like, well, if we fix the money, you don't need to worry about that, which means you can enjoy the present. And then you start addressing, you've got the time in their headspace to go, Money's taken care of because it works and it can be held into the future without being debased. So I've now got the headspace to actually live as a human should live in a very healthy way. Not to say everyone should go eating a diet of beef only, but give it a go. You know, <laughs> have a crack. Stop buying stuff that you perceive as cheap and easy because most things that are cheap and easy aren't very good for you. Is that a good, is that a good way to wrap it up? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just get you want to get to the base layer of everything the base layer of money, the base layer of money, I, yeah. I think it is, or the best money is Bitcoin. And that's the, also the most simple, yeah. even though it seems complex to people and the best food is whole yeah. food, just like whatever exists. And then you find your balance within that. I mean, it's yeah. unrealistic to say to tell someone to go 100% into Bitcoin. Um, it, it's unrealistic for someone to say, only eat beef. Um, you got to kind of try and mm. just see what works for you. I mean, it's different for everyone and mm. really just getting down to the basics and actually listening to the results and, and having failures is, is the best way to learn. Oh, even better, even more great advice if for all areas of life. Thank you so much. Let's wrap it up there because we've kind of gone format all over the place and tech difficulties, but tell people where they can find you and where they can buy your amazing wine. And when I'm in America, do you ship internationally? I wish I'm USA only right now. You, you can find my wine yeah. at okay. peonylanewine.com and I ship all over the US. If you want to buy with Bitcoin and have it shipped to you, I use Oshi. It's an app where there's a ton of awesome Bitcoin goods or just places that accept Bitcoin. You can buy beef, you can buy mining stuff, you can buy, I mean, clothing and yep. wine and everything. So Oshi is a great spot. And then um, everything you need. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I know of one friend in particular who is, um, she's from California, but had she lives in New Zealand and we became friends by living in Queenstown. Um, and her dad 
is a member of a wine club and he still travels to New Zealand just to, to drink wine. So I'm going to get him <laughs> onto that via her for sure. Um, so thank you so much. And what was your Twitter handle? Remind me, I've got it here. I will make sure it's linked, but tell people where they can find you there. At Ben Justman, if you want to see pocket steak and some wine pictures. <laughs> yeah. And the documenting of your house build. It's all, I'm actually going to link a couple of your tweets linking directly to that. Cause that was very cool. Thank you awesome. so much. Great to meet you. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch again soon. Sweet. Great to meet you, Amy. Hello, my friend, as someone who is not the best at finishing the things they start. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this podcast. I hope you found it helpful. Maybe it piqued your curiosity on something new or even just made you smile for a few seconds. If any of those things apply here, then all my regular tech challenges and tantrums are well worth it to get this to you. If you heard anything at all that you think could help just even one other human being, there's a couple of things you can do that I would really and truly appreciate. Firstly, you can follow or subscribe wherever you're listening. On most podcast platforms, this is usually just a case of hitting a follow button or a plus sign on the main show page. This means you'll never miss an episode, which is hopefully a win-win for us both. Secondly, if you're feeling really generous, you can leave me a five-star rating or review wherever you're listening. And lastly, feel free to share an episode with a friend on social media with any thoughts, feedback, suggestions, or even criticism. It's okay, I can take it. Just tag me using the handle at Amy Taylor Says to make sure I see it and can thank you personally. Any or all of these things genuinely mean more human beings see and hear these conversations. So again, thank you for being here and helping me with my mission with Be You Get Paid to help as many people as possible know themselves, know money and be happy. See you next time.